Well, today I'm going to begin a series called Lessons from the Kings. And we're going to go to the Old Testament, and we're going to spend some time talking about the kings and just glean some lessons from their lives. And some of you are thinking, well, this sounds exciting. Uh, and it actually is, because today uh, we're going to talk about King Asa, Asa, A-S-A. I remember as a young man desiring to read through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, cover to cover. Uh, and I must confess, the Old Testament was not uh, my idea of a good read. It really wasn't. Uh, in particular, there's an era that spans uh, over five centuries, and it takes in about 40 kings. And as you read through all of that in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you you begin to. Uh, realize that, that God placed these people in not only Israel's life to lead them, but in our lives today to, to point us on what to do and what not to do. And so I think it will be important for us to study these kings. Now, the era of the kings begins with people, Israel, saying it's not enough for God to be our king. We want a man to rule over us like other nations have. See, before the kings came into place, God placed judges like Gideon and Deborah and Jephthah to, to provide leadership and priests and prophets to guide them along their way. But man wanted more. Man wanted man. And the result was... Bad kings took control, mixed in with a few good kings, who of which many turned out to be bad in the end. And uh, uh, from this, though, we have learned many, many valuable lessons. And I think the first lesson that we can learn is this. Man can't solve our problems. Man can't solve your problems. Man can't solve our nation's problems. There's a myriad of scriptures that come to mind uh, that prove this, this lesson to be true. But there's one passage in particular that I want to begin with as an introduction, and it's found in 1 Samuel chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. And as we read through this, we'll find out what we lose when we turn over control of our lives to man rather than God. Verse 1 says, Now when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as Israel's leaders. And the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not follow his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain and accepted bribes, and they perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel, they gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, now, you're old. And your sons did not follow the lifestyle that you've lived and the way that you have led us. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased the man of God. This displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord. And the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they are rejecting, but they're rejecting me as their king. In verses 6 and 7, we see people wanting man to control their lives. It's amazing to me how quickly people, even Christians, will give control of their lives to a government control of their lives to a politician, control of their lives to an ideology, control of their lives even to a spiritual leader. And here we find that God is displeased with those thoughts and that process in our hearts and in our minds. And in verse 8, we read, as they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, they've forsaken me 
and now they're serving other gods, and they are doing the same thing to you because you are a man of God. So they've lost their commitment to me, and they're serving other gods. Go all the way to verse 11. Here's, here's what you lose when you want man to control your life rather than God. Verse 11 said, this is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots, his horses, and they'll run in front of his chariots. In other words, you're going to lose your children. You want man to control your life? You're going to lose your children. Verse 12. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. You lose your right to serve God exclusively. Actually, verse 13 says, your children will lose their destiny. He'll take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. Verse 14 And if you want man to rule your life, he's going to take the best of your fields and vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his attendants. In other words, you're going to lose your possessions. You're going to lose your wealth. You're going to lose what resources you have. You want a man to control your life? He's going to take everything you've got. That's what lordship is. And in verse 15 and 16, he will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage, and he's going to give it to his officials and attendants. Your male and female servants and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. What verses 15 and 16 is saying is that your tithe and your giving are going to be stolen and used for other purposes. And finally, we get to verse 17, and it says he'll take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. You want man to control your life? You want to give your life over to man to rule and reign? You will lose your freedoms. You will lose your freedom. And then we have this dialogue that happens in verses 19 through 21 between Samuel and the Lord. And it says in verse 19, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king. Then... We will be like all the other nations with a king to lead us and to go out before us and to fight our battles. And when Samuel heard all that the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. And in verse, uh, basically what, what he's saying is this, you want Samuel, Samuel, you want the people to have what they want? And Sam says, no, that's not what I want. I, I want them to serve you. He, he says, you know what? Just go tell them. Give them what they want. Give them a man to take my place. That's what they want. That's what they're going to get. That shouldn't be our desire. So over the next few weeks, I want to look at the lives of a few of the Old Testament kings, and we're going to learn from their example things to do and things not to do. Romans chapter 15, verse 4 in the New Testament says this, for everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. And that's what we're going to do over the next few weeks. We're going to learn from what was written in the past. We're going to learn from the lives that were lived as kings and leaders and see what can be applied and what can be removed in our lives. So today's teacher is King Asa. King Asa. Now, King Asa was a descendant of David. How how many of you would say that's pretty good stock? And he ruled Judah, which was the southern kingdom, for 41 years. Jeroboam at this time was ruling Israel. There had been a division in the nations between, and and it 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 shook out to to being two two uh, divi- a divided kingdom. There was Judah and there was Israel. Jeroboam was ruling Israel, and King Asa was ruling Judah, the southern kingdom. Here's the first lesson the church can learn from King Asa. You gotta have guts, church. You gotta have guts. What does that mean? It means you've gotta have some courage. You've gotta have some nerve, church. 
You've got to have some fearlessness, some moxie. Church, you, you, you've got to have daring. Let me say it this way. Maybe guts is a little strong for some of you. You've got to have intestinal fortitude. Church needs some guts. King Asa had them. I'll prove it to you. King Asa's father preceded him as king. And he was wicked and evil. His name was Abijah. 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 3 says this. He, then we're talking about King Asa's dad, who was the king before him. He committed all the sins his father, King Asa's grandfather, had done before him. His heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David, his forefather, had been. He was wicked and evil. Both his grandfather and his father had male shrine prostitutes in their court. And you know what King Asa did when he took control? He threw them all out. He got rid of them. Now, his grandmother was the queen mother. She was alive as he came in to rule. But she worshipped around Asheroth, around the Asherah pole, which was pagan. And so what her grandson did is he had all of those poles cut down and removed. And then he did the unthinkable. He said, uh, Grams, you're fired. You're fired. He removed her from her lofty place. How many of you know it takes guts to remove sacred cows? Yeah, I'm not calling grandma a sacred cow. It takes guts to repair what evil has destroyed. It takes guts to stand in the face of evil and tyranny and wickedness in our nation and say, we are the sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Yes. We will serve the Lord. Yes. And here are the things that are anti-Bible we will not stand for. Come on. Come on. It takes guts. Intestinal fortitude. And we have to continue to stand when the circumstances are stacked against you. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 is a familiar passage of Scripture found in the narrative that is the armor of God. And it says, therefore, that word therefore, dia, is used because of the previous verse, verse 12. Can you go to verse 12? Verse 12 says, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That's our problem, church. We try to make it personal. We try to wrestle and fight and vocalize against people, against flesh and blood. And that's not who our battle is against. It's against the principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of the, this age that, that is behind all of these people. And, and, and we, we fight against spiritual hosts uh, in, in, in the spiritual realm, the heavenly places. So verse 13 says, therefore, because of that, because of this previous verse, your battle, your stand, isn't against a downturn in the economy. It isn't against someone in the White House or in the State House. It isn't against a disease in your body. It isn't against a person. Your stand is against who's behind it all. It's the enemy. When will the church learn that we're wasting our time fighting things that God said you aren't to fight? You're to fight what's behind them. And if people get in the way, then they'll get run over. If, if things get in the way, they're going to get plowed under. But you've got to fight against things that are spiritual. And the way you do that is not with physical weapons. That's what this, uh, this is saying. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says. So therefore, take your thoughts, your words, and your attitudes off of the messengers and carriers of, of evil and put them on God himself. Put your thoughts, 
your, your mind, your words on God himself. Because there will come an evil day in your life. In the evil day, Panera, bad, wicked, malicious days that are to come. <clears throat> L.H. Commentary calls the evil day any day that the devil seizes. It's time to stand. It's time to stand. But pastor, I've been standing for my health. I've been standing for America. I've been standing for our state. I've been standing for my husband, for my wife, for my relationship. I've been standing and I'm weary and I'm tired because I don't see anything happening. And the Bible says, having done all to stand, having done all to stand, stand. That's having guts, intestinal fortitude. What does Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12 say? In the Amplified, it says, in order that you may not grow disinterested and become spiritual sluggards, but imitators behaving as those who through faith, by their leaning on the entire personality uh, on, uh, of God in Christ, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, and by practice of patient endurance and waiting, are now inheriting the promise. That's a whole lot of words to get to the promise. But it's true. Nonetheless, King Asa had an intestinal fortitude. He had grit. He had courage. He had guts. It takes that to overcome. It takes that to win. He ruled for 41 years, and 36 of those years, the nation lived in peace, absolute peace, absolute health. Why? Because he began with some guts, intestinal fortitude, fortitude, courage. And that's what it takes to overcome. That's what it takes to win. The second thing that we can learn from King Asa is he trusted in God. I mean, we as believers say all the time, trust God, trust in God. I'm trusting in God. We say it all the time. It's become a real catchphrase for us. But I want to read you a story about King Asa's trust in God. Second Chronicles chapter 14. It's actually the, the entire chapter, 15 verses. Let me read it quickly. Follow along with me, because it's a, it's a wonderful story. When Abijah died, he was buried in the city of David. Then his son Asa became the next king, and there was peace in the land for 10 years. Asa did what was pleasing and good in the sight of the Lord his God. He removed the foreign altars and pagan shrines. He smashed the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah poles. He commanded the people of Judah to seek the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and to obey his law and his commands. Asa also removed the pagan shrines, as well as the incense altars from every one of Judah's towns. So Asa's kingdom enjoyed a period of peace. Now, during those peaceful years, he was able to build up the fortified towns throughout Judah. No one tried to make war against him at this time, for the Lord was giving him rest, giving him peace from his enemies. And Asa told the people of Judah, let's build towns. Let's fortify them with walls. It's not making a political statement or anything. It's just the scripture here. <laughs> Towers, gates, bars. The land is ours because we sought the Lord our God, and he has given us peace on every side. So they went ahead with these projects and brought them to completion. And King Asa had an army of 300,000 warriors from the tribe of Judah, armed with large shields and spears. And he also had an army of 280,000 warriors from the tribe of Benjamin, armed with small shields and bows. Both armies were composed of well-trained fighting men. Now, once an Ethiopian named Zerah attacked Judah with an army of one million men. And 300 chariots, which Judah didn't have. So they were technologically advanced. They advanced to the town of Marishah. Are you still allowing me to read this story to you? Still with me? I know sometimes, you know, this is, these are vegetables today. How many of you know we need the veggies? We need them. So... Asa deployed his armies for battle in the valley north of Marisha. Greatly outnumbered. And now look what he did. He cried out to the Lord his God. Oh Lord, 
No one but you can help the powerless against the mighty. That's the word of the Lord, if you're going to say you trust God. Lord, no one can help but you. I put all my bananas on your boat. Lord, Lord, if the ship goes down, I'm going down with it. Lord, if you're going to leave it up to me or a man, I'm going to be powerless against that million man army. Help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you alone. And it's your name that we have come with against this vast horde. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere men prevail against you. Only a man who trusts in God can, can look at an army of a million men marching towards them to slaughter them and say, they're just mere men. And only a believer in the darkness and evil of this hour can stand in the face of it and say, God's got this. I trust God. I trust God with my whole heart. Asa trusted in God. There's, there's something... Well, we better finish it. Verse 12. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah and the army fled. The enemy fled. Asa and his army pursued them as far as Gerar and then so many Ethiopians fell that they were unable to rally. They were destroyed by the Lord and his army and the army of Judah carried off a vast amount of plunder. While they were there at uh, Gerard, they attacked all the towns in that area, and terror from the Lord came upon the people there. And as a result, a vast amount of plunder was taken from these towns too. They also attacked the camps of herdsmen and captured sheep, goats, camels, before finally returning to Jerusalem. How many did you say that was a big victory? Amen. In the face of a million, they trusted in God. We can learn that lesson. There's something about the previous generation of believers my parents, my, my grandparents, my great-grandparents who had a simple faith and trust in the Lord. I, I so revere and honor them when I hear their stories. You know, we live in a time where, where um, in our generation, generation that follows me, we have everything at our disposal. I mean, if you can think it, it, it we have it. And, and on one hand, it's wonderful, but sometimes it robs of, of us of that simple trust and faith in God. They wrote songs and sang them like trust and obey. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, this is the first verse, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, with all who will trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly drives it away. Not a doubt, not, nor a fear, not a sigh, nor a tear can abide while we trust and obey. <clears throat> trust and obey, for there's no other way. To be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. I know most of you have never heard that, but <laughs> as a boy, I sang that and saw my parents and my grandparents live it. One of my favorites that they sang was, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge neath the healing, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace 
to trust him more. Well, I must have been the only one that ever sang that song as well. Back to 2 Chronicles chapter 14, verse 12. Verse 12 says this. So the Lord defeated the Ethiopians in the presence of Asa and the army of Judah, and the enemy fled. The Hebrew word for trust is nephal, and it means to lean on, to support oneself. Lean on me when you're not strong. Sorry. When I start singing, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that when I hear th- words or phrases, a song pops up and I just sing it. Anybody like that? Anybody? Yeah? Wow. I'll be your strength. I'll help you carry on. Okay, all right. I'd sing a Taylor Swift song, but I don't know any, so. (laughs) Trusting God. Just some quick bullet points. Trusting God means staying calm when you're under attack. Psalm 27, verse 3 says this. Even if a whole army surrounds me, I will not be afraid. Even if enemies attack me, I will still trust God. Trusting God is our work. It's our job. It's our labor. John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Then the, uh, they then said, what are we to do that we may habitually be working the works of God? What are we to do to carry out what God requires? And Jesus replied, this is the work. This is the service that God asks of you. want to know what to do as a believer? Well, here it is that you believe in the one whom he has sent, and that you cleave to, that you trust, that you rely on and have faith in his messenger. God's looking for our trust. Psalm 53, verse 2. God looks down from heaven on all people. He's up there in heaven looking. What's he looking for? He wants to see if there are any who understand. He wants to see if there are any who trust in God. He's scouring the earth to see if you're in faith or fear. He's scouring the earth to find somebody who understands and believes that his word is true and who will stand on it in the face of unsurmountable odds and say, I trust God, I trust his word, and I trust that it's going to come to pass. I believe that all things are going to work out for my good. God's looking for that person. What will he find when his eyes hit you? Honor God by trusting him, and he will honor you. Proverbs 3, verse 5, in the message. Trust God from the bottom of your heart. Don't try to figure out everything on your own. Listen for God's voice in everything you do, everywhere you go. He's the one who will keep you on track. So don't assume that you know it all. Last lesson this morning from King Asa. Number three, he didn't finish well. Late in King Asa's reign, King Basha, who was now the king of Israel, the northern kingdom, began to prepare for war against Judah. And so King Asa, who had always trusted in God, always went to God, this time negotiated, actually a a better word for it, uh, it was not negotiation, he actually bribed Ben-Hadad and asked him, it was an enemy, he was an enemy, and he, he bribed him to back him against Israel, against uh, King Basha. And so uh, when he did do that, grabbed a known enemy and partnered with him, then Israel, uh, led by King Basha, backed down. And God wasn't happy. Look at Second Chronicles chapter 16, beginning at verse 7. Now at that time... Hanani, the seer, the prophet of God, came to King Asa and told him, on behalf of God, because you've put your trust in the king of Aram, instead of the Lord, your God, you missed your chance 
to wipe out the enemy once and for all, to destroy the army of the king of Aram. Don't you remember what happened to the Ethiopians and the Libyans and their million-man army with all their chariots and all their charioteers? You relied on the Lord. You trusted in God. You called upon the name of the Lord. And he handled them, handed them over to you. And the eyes of the Lord are searching the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose, whose hearts are fully committed to him. What a fool you've been. So because of your foolishness, not trusting God, because you are now trusting in man, you've actually partnered with your enemies, from now on your peace is gone and you're going to be at war. And Asa became so angry with the prophet of God that he threw him in prison. I mean, it's like throwing God in prison. And he put him in stocks and he began to oppress some of his own people. He became mad and became angry, really at God. Second Chronicles chapter 14, we just read verses 2. Asa did what was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. Verse 11, then Asa called the Lord his God and said, Lord, there's no one like you to help the powers against, against the mighty. Help us, Lord our God, for we rely on you. In your name we have come against this vast army. Lord, you are our God. Do not let mere mortals prevail against you. What happened to that guy? Where'd he go? As a result, Asa didn't finish well. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 12 says, In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was afflicted with the disease in his feet. Though his disease was severe, even in his illness, he did not seek help from the Lord, but only from man. Then in the 41st year of the reign, Asa died and rested, was buried with his ancestors. It's a sad ending. But it doesn't have to be that way for you and for me. Church, we need some guts. We need some courage. We need some strength. We need some intestinal fortitude to stand against the enemy of the Lord. He's not a king of Aram. He is the devil himself and all of his entities that he has working for him. And we need some guts to stand in the face of the enemy and say, not on my watch. We are the church of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. We are the church of the living Lamb of God, the Son of God. And we are not going to back down to the devil. We are not going to be da back down to his horde of, of a million demons, we are going to stand up and say, we trust in God. We trust in the Lord. I think we need to get back to simple faith. Read the word. Stop spending all your time going to links that tell you how bad things are and who the bad people are. Start spending your time going back to the simplicity of God's word and say, I can do that. That's who I am. That's what I need to stand against. Back to a simple faith of trusting God. And if we'll do that, we will finish well. well we're, 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 I, can, I can see the finish line. I see the tape now. For the first time in my life, I can see the tape stretched out across the track, and we're all headed for it. We're at, at the end of the end. We're, we're running. Listen, if you're old, it's time to get young, because the finish line is in sight, and, and God doesn't need you feeble. He needs you strong and healthy and energized. If, you're, if, if, if you are, are sick or diseased, weak and weary, God needs you with energy and health. Contend for it. 
Believe God for it. Trust God for it. We need to all together head to the finish line and take in many with us to heaven. We need to finish well. Do what is necessary. I mean, I'm, I'm right now doing uh, things physically. I'm pushing myself because I want to live a long life, a strong life. I want to live a life where God can energize me. I personally have a lot to do left. I personally have a lot of people to lead to Christ personally. Yet our church uh, it needs to be packed to the gills every service with people who've come to know Jesus. We're not looking for people who are looking for another church. We're looking for people who need Jesus. But, but for that to happen, you need to have guts and courage to tell somebody about Jesus. For that to happen, you have strength and health in your body to, to mentor them and get them to the finish line with the rest of us. The end is near. Let's go. Let's don't stand on the, on the side of the road with a sign that says the end is near. Repent or you're going to hell. Throw that sign down and get out there and tell somebody about Jesus. Show somebody who God is. Lay hands on the sick and watch them recover. And if it needs to be you first, then let it be you first. Let's finish well, church. Let's stand. Thank you, Lord, for our time together in your word. We thank you, Father, for health for our flesh and strength for our bodies. We thank you that our spirits are energized and charged. Oh, we thank you, Father, that as we pray in the spirit and pray with understanding, as, as we read the word and, and as you bring light and life to us through it, as we get revelation, Father, as we, as we begin to understand what's happening in the world and, and as a result, no one understand what you're doing and what's happening in the kingdom of God so that we can partner with it. We thank you that we, we will trust you. We will live lives of trust with courage and we will finish well. In Christ Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. I want us to do something. Uh, I want us, you know, I, I, I don't know how, what your personality is like. Um, uh, maybe I don't always show this, but my personality is very low key. And <laughs> I know I was just yelling at you, but... Um, <laughs> My personality is very low key, and I, 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 uh, you know, I just prefer quiet and peace. I like to live a quiet and peaceable life. Uh, but I also know <clears throat> this is a, a, a day and a time, an hour that God is requiring His church to, to step out, side of ourselves, and move with Him. And so <clears throat> we're going to do a little exercise before we go. Lift your hands, your hearts, and get ready to lift your voices. And just for a moment, just for a moment, let's tell the Lord, we're, we're on. We're with you. We're with you. We're with you. You can count on us. You're looking at me? Are you looking at me? You looking at me, God? Well, what you see is a man who trusts you. What you see is a man who is going to serve you with his whole heart. I'll do anything. I'll put away anything. I'll set anything aside that is necessary to be used fully and completely by you. In Jesus' name. Come on, tell him. You tell him that. I can't speak for you. You tell him that. Lord, Lord, here I am. Here we are. Come on, out loud, tell him. Out loud, tell him. Lord, here we are, Father, and we submit our lives to you. We tell you, Father, today that my life is yours. I don't, I don't give my life, I don't pledge my allegiance to a man, to a party, to a person, to an ideology. My loyalty is to the kingdom of God. My loyalty 
loyalty is to the one true God. I will serve you all the days of my life with energy, life, vitality, strength, and health. I will make it to the finish line, and I'll take many people with me. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that I come out of myself and submit myself to you. Use me in a way that you, like, unlike you've ever used me before as I yield myself to you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. And everybody said, so be it. So be it.